I chose this um, backdrop because film noir oftentimes is made in black and white. I didn't give you guys a black and white noir the semester. I probably should have, but a lot of the ones I like to do, I've been kind of burnt out on teaching. Um, some famous ones are for ones from the 40s are Casablanca. Um, there's a there's a one called The Big Sleep, which is a really good one. The Maltese Falcon. There's all kinds of really good ones from the 40s, but I, I gave you one from the late 50s to kick off our unit this time. So um, let me kind of just kind of briefly explain to you what the water is. So film the water is a French term. That literally means black film or dark film. So noir in French means black. Okay. So calling it a black film is a little bit of a misnomer if you have like a literal translation from the French. So that's why we call it dark film. And it's a Hollywood genre that sprang up in the 1940s in America. And this is when this became really big. So the next two units we're going to do in this class, film noir and westerns, we both, these are both genres that sprang up in the 1940s. Okay. So as, as I said, noir is often filmed in black and white and made use of lighting and shadows, though this tendency translated over to color as well. So as I'll show you guys in a moment, Vertigo definitely makes use of lighting and shadows. Um, as far as the structure of a noir story, noir often takes the form of a crime story mystery. A typical protagonist is a private eye detective. So uh, these usually take, these are usually murder mysteries or, or they might start out like somebody might be having an affair you better go investigate this detective. Right? They, they oftentimes take this detective style structure. And you guys might have actually seen some movies like this, or maybe even seen movies like this referenced. I know, um, I know just for instance, in the movie Home Alone, right, Macaulay Culkin watches this noir film, right, during the during the movie, it's where the guy starts shooting people, right? I know everybody's probably seen all alone, but uh, yeah, like for, their noirs are often referenced in lots of media today. So it became popular in the 40s, due in no small part to the growing population of American cities. You don't see film noir taking place out in the country too much. Usually, film noir has a very urban backdrop. So, usually, um, usually you might have a city like Los Angeles. Los Angeles is by far the most common one. But sometimes you have Chicago as a backdrop. Um, 1930s, 1940s Hollywood. Right? This one takes place in San Francisco in the 50s. Uh, San Francisco in the 50s looked a lot different. A little bit, a lot different than it does today, but a lot of it's still the same. There's like windy, twisty streets uh, that the movie so expertly shows. Um, that's that's definitely part of San Francisco today. If any of you guys, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been there, but uh, that's it's kind of got that sort of busy feeling to the streets. Right, you can kind of easily get lost there. But uh, the genre peaked in the 70s. It's often has said that one of the last great noirs is called Chinatown. Um, I see your comment, Ali. I'm going to actually talk about a wonderful life in a second. But uh, Chinatown is one of the last great noir films starring Jack Nicholson in, in the 70s. But film noir, pretty much, I'm not. That's one of the last great classic noirs, I should say. Pretty much all the ones that we're going to watch through the rest of our unit are movies that have been filmed since the early 2000s. So I'm giving you guys an early one with Vertigo 
and I'm giving you guys some early 2000s ones next week. So I'm not, we're not going to watch too many of the older ones, but we're going to kind of skip right from a little bit older up to pretty close to the present next week with the two films we're going to watch next week. But like I said, in the 70s it peaks. But noir also translated over well to other genres. So science fiction, for instance. Science fiction oftentimes takes this sort of noir. This is a rank city, right? This is a rank city full of sin and corruption, all this type of stuff. So science fiction oftentimes employs it. Uh, if you guys have ever seen the film Blade Runner, for instance, uh, that, that's called a neo-noir, but it takes place in the future when androids are sort of walking around. So uh, the last movie we're going to watch in our unit, Watchmen, um, that movie is a comic book movie that kind of has an urban noir backdrop. So um, this is the genre. As far as some tropes of the genre, by far the biggest trope of the genre is, is called the femme fatale archetype. The femme fatale archetype has come from this genre. Uh, femme fatale in French, again, I told you guys, you'll learn a little bit of French in this class just because all, all film study was made by the French. But um, femme fatale literally means fatal woman. A fatal woman. So usually these femme fatale characters, think about back in the 40s and 50s, right? S sexual mores were pretty strict for women. Like this was before the sexual revolution in the 1960s when uh, things like free love and all that started, right? Sexuality for women in the 40s and 50s was pretty prescribed. I mean, it's rare that. Uh, I mean, usually the girl would get married and her husband would be the only man she would ever, she would ever not be with. Well, the, so the film Fatal character kind of sprang out of that, right? This is a character in the 40s and 50s that sort of oozes sexuality and charisma, right? She's dangerous, right? If you, the, it's oftentimes compared to a black widow spider. Right, you guys know that Black Widow spiders. I've heard this is a myth, but it's a myth. It's a myth that is pretty widespread to the fact it's almost become common knowledge. Black Widow spiders are said to eat the female Black Widow spiders are said to eat their mate, their male mate after uh, after they mate. So <laughs> they literally kill them and eat them. Right, so that the femme fatale character archetype is often compared to the, the black widow spider. I have a question here, maybe we can before I move on. But uh, can any of you guys think of a femme fatale character, and maybe in any other movies or television shows you've seen? Uh, we definitely got one today with Vertigo, but um, I'll open the floor to you guys. Have you guys seen, have, can you guys give some examples of this type of character trope? Anybody here? <laughs> I was kind of thinking of a dumb answer to that question, like Blanche from Golden Girls, but then I read it and I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit, right? She, she's a womanizer or she's a, she has lots of men, right? Yeah. <laughs> I sent you a message in chat. Um, I don't know if you ever watched Supernatural, but I think her wasn't 
So there was one character, I can't think of the name at the moment, but she betrays Dean and Sam like multiple times just to get a bunch of stuff. It's very, it's been forever since I watched that season, but she was this beautiful girl, like kind of resembled the picture on your side here. And like she, she had a gun. I think it was the cult. Uh, the whole point at the beginning of the series, try to get the cult gun. And she would like act like she was going to help them get it. And once she got it, she betrayed them. And then everything else happened afterwards. And they finally got the gun back. But I think of uh, Dan from The Office. From The Office, Machina. What was it? Which character from The Office? J uh, Jan. Jan. She's the one that was like Michael's girlfriend for a little bit. That's a good. That's a good comparison. Yeah, she's such a little turd. Um, I don't remember. I think the name of it is um, Basic Instinct, maybe. Oh yeah, no, that's a classic. I think. I think yeah. uh, I can't think of that lady's name, but um, I think she had, like, she had, an, they had an affair, maybe. It's been a long time since I've seen that one. And then, um, then he tries to call it off. And then even after he calls it off, um, like, she does, like, all these crazy things just to try to get back at him, get back at his family. And uh, she pretty much, I mean, she pretty much just goes crazy. That's a good example, Stacey. Basic instinct. Glenn Close played that part. Um, Michael Douglas has the affair with her in the movie, and then she just kind of like, then she just snaps off the rails. Would yeah, Angel Michael Douglas, I couldn't think of her name, yeah. Would Angelina Jolene and Mr. or Mrs. Smith be one where she tries, where she's supposed to assassinate her husband? Yeah, I know that movie. You could probably make that case. Yeah. I don't know why. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one that came to mind for me was uh, the character Mirage from The Incredibles, the the lady with the white hair that tries to lure Mr. Incredible into come, becoming a superhero again. Right. Um, I put mine in chat, but if you've ever watched Euphoria, there's a character on there named Maddie. And she's like a total girl boss. Like she does everything because she knows she's beautiful so she can get anything she wants. So that's who I thought of. I haven't watched that show. Uh, my wife watches it. I haven't watched that show yet. I've heard it's pretty good though. Regina George. Of, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I kind of think of uh, like, um, I can't think what they're called. Uh, it's, not, it's a praying mantis, you know. Like, because they eat their they eat their husband or their mates after they, yeah, they bite its head off. My husband actually called me that today because I snapped at him. <laughs> <laughs> the Games of Thrones, the Lannister woman, the you know the queen woman. The, you know, I don't know if you've ever watched a Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. but she reminds me of that because she's willing to kill whoever to get her family to the top. Would Jessica Rabbit be one? Yeah, Jessica Rabbit. Mm -hmm. I was thinking Poison Ivy Poison off of Ivy. Batman. Yeah. I was named after Jessica Rabbit. My mom had to watch it for film class when she was pregnant for me in college and named me after the character. <laughs> I thought of Regina George from Mean Girls. Regina, yeah, from Mean Girls. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> I do that movie sometimes in this class. That's, that's a that's a favorite. Yeah, you got you guys are getting it. You know the archetype. We named a plethora of examples right there. Um, Sharon Stone in the movie Basic Instinct was also another famous film fatale. Usually they kind of have dark hair, but sometimes they're blonde too. But most of the time they have their brunettes in these movies. So 
to try to transfer over to the film now, now that I introduced the genre, our director this time is Alfred Hitchcock. Now, Alfred Hitchcock is one of the biggest directors ever. He's, he's one of the most famous directors of all time. He's probably, as far as the most famous directors of all time, it's probably a tie between him and Stanley Kubrick. I'm going to watch a couple of Stanley Kubrick films later in the class. Hitchcock is by far one of the most famous. He's certainly one of the most famous early Hollywood directors in the, in the early golden ages of Hollywood. There's a West, there's a really good Western director too in the golden age of Hollywood named John Ford. But uh, Hitchcock is a pioneer, right? He's he's definitely known for his suspense his suspense films, which Vertigo is one. But uh, some other movies that he's known for: Strangers on a Train, Rear, Rear Window, North by Northwest, and then the famous horror films Psycho and The Birds. Those yeah, are... I like The Birds. I I used to watch that all the time, and my kids would be like. Mom, what kind of show are you watching? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very disturbing movie. I don't know if you if any of you guys have never seen it. It's a very disturbing. But Hitchcock is Hitchcock is known in a lot of his movies for having a leading lady more than a leading man. Usually Hitchcock was especially sort of attracted to beautiful blondes. Right, which is, we definitely get that here in Vertigo with Kim Novak. But um, he was very much attracted to them. There's a lot of discussion about Hitchcock. I think you know, he used a lot of like old school directing tricks that would probably get him called out and canceled today. Right, like he was, he almost was very obsessive about the women that he directed. Um, it's said that he didn't really have much of a like a sexual relationship with his own wife, so he oftentimes got a feverish attraction almost to some of his leading ladies. So um, he he would probably be called out for sexual harassment and stuff today for some of the stuff that he did. But he was also known for trying to get a rise out of the actors. Like he would sometimes bully the actors on set and things like that. He stares at that in common with Stanley Kubrick. Um, but Hitchcock's most famous, he's most famous for being an editor, right? This movie has some really good editing in it. He's also known for a technique called the ticking time bomb. So, um, the ticking time bomb literally means like imagine a scenario where you have a bomb under the table, right? Imagine a scenario where you have a bomb under the table and it's liable to blow up at any second. And then you have characters like talking to each other and stuff while you know that that bomb is getting ready to go off. So um, Hitchcock invented this technique, the ticking time bomb and lots of other directors are famous for sort of borrowing from that idea like Quentin Tarantino for instance uses that technique ticking time bomb well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bomb right but it could be you know something's going to blow up on any second so you're just kind of waiting for it you know and maybe they keep dragging it out and out and out that's a suspense technique that Hitchcock invented. He's also, I forgot to mention here, he also did a TV show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which was almost like a Twilight Zone type of show from the 60s. But he also did that. But, um, he's very famous in literary and film studies. Um, most of the time his films have great psychological depth and are studied from a psychoanalytic point of view. So I think our discussion today will almost mirror that because the characters in this movie are very rich psychologically. There's a lot to talk about there.
And then the next line or leading man in the movie is Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart was one of the icons of the Hollywood Golden Age. Eileen um, mentioned It's a Wonderful Life a minute ago. He was, a, he was the main star in It's a Wonderful Life. He was also known for another Hitchcock film, Rear Window. And he's in one of the greatest Westerns of all time, too. The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. He stars alongside John Wayne in that film. So um, I'm sure most of, if you guys, if you guys haven't watched a lot of these other films, I'm sure most of you have probably watched It's a Wonderful Life at some point before. Because that's I a, can't even have a good Christmas without watching It's a Wonderful Life. It's my favorite. Yeah, it's a wonderful life. It's my favorite too. So you, you, you two probably definitely recognize Jimmy Stewart from, from that movie. Yeah, he's a great actor. Yeah, he's known for having that sort of drawl in his voice, right? And that's one of his that's one of his uh, sort of traits as an actor. He has that sort of drawl in his voice. He's got the blonde hair and the blue eyes and all that stuff, too. Very good actor. Very good actor. I even thought, like, the one point, uh, like, in the movie, um, like, in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, I'm trying to think which part it is. He's, like, standing on the street, and when the film kind of, like, it comes around at him, and it kind of gets, like, really close, and it's, like, zoomed in, like, right on his eyes, and his eyes are, like, really big, and he's, like, breathing real heavily. Like, I kind of related that to almost, like, the panic and uh, the suspense, uh, and almost, like, the anxiousness that he had in some of the parts last night, uh, uh, you know, when I finished watching this. Like, I don't know, it was just a uh, just the like the look in his eye from that movie. Um, it's a wonderful life. I thought the same thing. It's very, it's very emotive with his eyes. His acting is very emotive in that way. Yeah, I'm, I'll show you some shots in a second. Probably some that you were thinking of, Stacy, when you when you mentioned it. Jimmy Stewart's a leading man. He's he's a little old in this film. Like he's he's in his fifties here. Today we have lots of actors in their fifties, and you don't really see their age. You started to see Jimmy Stewart's age a little bit in, in this one, especially with compared to Kim Novak, who's in her early twenties. Right? Kim Novak is our leading lady here. Here's of course you know that. She has two appearances in the movie, the Madeline appearance, right, and her other appearance as well, close to the end. So the blonde and the brunette, right? She, she plays both here. That's part of the plot of the movie. So Kim Novak. Some of her other titles include Middle of the Night and Amorous Adventures of Ma Flanders. And Novak chose to leave Hollywood early. She was never really happy there. She wasn't, you know, she just never felt comfortable there. So she didn't act for very long. But um, she's still living today. She's talked famously about how she was in a relationship with a couple of actors like Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. So um, you know, she, lots of times the actresses in the golden age of Hollywood, like they would sometimes get with the actors and stuff. That was that was pretty common. It still is. And most recently, back in 2014, she presented an Oscar at the Academy Awards. So, Donald Trump made headlines when he said that she should call her plastic surgeon. And so she kind of had like Botox in her face. Donald, Donald Trump wrote a nasty tweet about her as recent as 2014. You know, she was in her 80s. Right. <laughs> right so, uh, and you can, you can look that whole story up if you choose. And our other actor that I'm 
Rick mentioned in here is Barbara Bell Geddes who plays Midge. She was, she adored Hitchcock as a director, but Hitchcock didn't see her as conventionally attractive enough to play one of his leading ladies. So uh, she kind of takes on a supporting role here. But besides the Vertigo, she's mostly known for being on the show Dallas. I don't know if any of you guys have older folks in here have ever watched Dallas. I mean, Dallas was a very famous show in the 70s and 80s. I've never watched it myself, but my parents had. So um, who shot JR, right? You guys might have heard that phrase. That's how, that's how Dallas ended. So, yeah, she has a very interesting part in the film. I'll be eager to hear what you guys have to say about her role in a second. Um, some themes in Vertigo, basophobia, the fear of falling, right? and related anxiety slash panic attacks. Any of you guys have ever had a panic attack in here, right? This probably resonated with you because Jimmy Stewart has lots of Jimmy Stewart's character has lots of panic attacks, right? Leading to his, leading to what he thought was Madeline's suicide, right? We have the theme of appearance versus reality and hidden identities, right? So this is almost a very philosophical theme, right? What is real? What is fiction, right? How do people project themselves? Is this somebody's real identity, right? Or are they pretending to be someone else? How do we kind of dispel uh, fantasy from reality? So this is a big fit theme in Vertigo, for sure. Um, male obsession and desire, right? It's kind of hard to argue that uh, the main character here doesn't get very obsessive with Madeline. Right. You know, he, he starts investigating her case and then he gets obsessed with her. Um, the Freudian death drive. Sigmund Freud, along with his um, theory of childhood development, he also can had this theory that mankind is always sort of looking towards its own death. Right. We always sort of fantasize about our own deaths. Right. Some we do things like, let's say you smoke cigarettes, right? You smoke cigarettes knowing they're gonna kill you, right? The Freud's argued that, uh, yeah, that's part of humanity's own death drive. Um, so there's a there's definitely a lot big theme of death here, especially with suicide. And there's a couple of attempts at suicide in the film, so death and the death drive and then basically just the duality of man right the good and evil within all of us is um you could say is probably a theme here but you guys might think of more these are ones that i just came up with after watching it So I wanted to talk a little bit about mise -en, about some film elements too. Some mise en scene in the film. San Francisco is definitely the backdrop. You can this is still a very famous place. You can go to look at the Golden Gate Bridge. Vertigo made this place famous, so you can still actually go. If you go to San Francisco today, you can still go to this spot where uh, she jumped into the into the bay. So. Uh, you have this shot of the, from underneath the bridge is a famous one. Here's a shot of the 1950 San Francisco um, early in the film, like as he's following her in his car. Right? There's lots of like twists and turns and all this stuff, right? So he almost sort of got dizzy and hypnotic even watching that scene, right? Because she'd take a right, then a left, then a right. Now, I actually linked you guys to a video on our Bright Space page, but he kind of breaks down the geography of that. Right? She kind of leads him in a big circle, which is really interesting. Um, 
He pretty much gets on Google Maps and looks. Like she pretty much leads him out a big circle through the city. So, um, yeah, this is definitely a backdrop of the city. San Francisco looks clean in this movie. It doesn't really have that like dark, urban, gritty background that, like Los Angeles does. If you, go, if you go to San Francisco today, it's far from clean. Right? There's lots of problems there with homelessness, and things like that, mainly because it's so darn expensive to live there. Like a one room apartment's like three grand a month if you live in San Francisco. And it's no wonder that they have a big homelessness problem. But um, you have lots of collar and, in, and sets in these interior rooms, like Midge's room here. Like they have this like yellow. Hitchcock uses very bright collars here. Like her apartment is this like real bright yellow inside the restaurant when he sees Madeline for the first time. There's lots of like bright reds. Um, there's lots of blue in the film too. Um, I'll show you with a blue, the usage of blue in a minute. And oftentimes like film critics and stuff have said anytime you see these bright reds in the film, I'm wearing bright red today myself, right? Anytime you see these bright reds, they're sort of echoing like our main character's libido, right? He sees her and he gets excited by her. And red collars oftentimes perhaps illustrate that. So it's hard to argue that this isn't some very bright, vivid red in the scene in the restaurant. Course. This is, this is going to be a dumb question. I'm sorry to interrupt. But no. what does it mean by that green color? Because I noticed that a lot within the film, like the bright green. Okay. We'll get, we'll get to that in just a second, Jay, because that's the next slide. Um, but good question. We also have uh, the rooftops, right, which is part of this movie's called Vertigo, right, because of his fear of height. So we get these rooftops, including at the Spanish mission, this, this Catholic church, this old mission from the 1600s that's still there, which is part of the suicide plot. So we get rooftops as a setting to sort of throw us into this busy state. Um, this is the shot. I think this is what you were talking about, Jaden. Uh, these are some famous shots. But here we have this, sort of this neon light coming in from the street. But this is a, I talked a minute ago about the duality of man, right? The good and evil and all of this. Right? Well, Madeline is, has two identities in the movie, right? So this, this shot definitely kind of shows both of her identities, right? Half of her face is lit in white, half of it's in pure darkness. So that's not an accidental shot, right? That, that's meant to convey something about her personality. Then there's the shot, there's a silhouette shot of her. This is a very noir like shot in the film. Um, but we have the green collars here too. I don't know. When her dress in the first scene, when the big red velvet room, like, helped foreshadow that she's like kind of more like the evil type, going off the base of like the color. Right. Are you talking about this the scene that I showed you in, in the restaurant? Yeah, she wears a bright like emerald green dress. Now, I was just wondering if that was like a foreshadow of what we were about to learn or if that was just, you know, like coincidence. No, you can, you can guess with Hitchcock that everything was purposeful. Like he was very careful and meticulous. So, yeah, I think you would be right to say that that was, that that was some foreshadowing. 
his, his, I thought so too, like about the green dress because in the restaurant, like the walls, because they were, um, I don't know, like just an odd color for, um, for a restaurant. And it was like everything in there was like that bright red, deep burgundy and all that. Um, and all the other colors, it kind of seemed like um, it was like that green really popped. It, it contrasted with the red so much. It was like, that's all like, that's all you saw in there. Like, you know, your focus went straight to her um, when they were in that restaurant. Jaden, uh, you mentioned on the discussion board, the, the Sequoia forest scene too, where you get that sort of contrast in colors. Yeah, her white coat made her look kind of like she like glowed or or even transparent. It was just really weird. And I was talking with that my mom. She's like, I don't know. It's just she's like, I don't know if this is by accident. It's such an older film against the green screen or not. It's like to my mind. It just because she appeared as taken over a ghost before we even knew it. I just thought, well, they're trying to show that this ghostly thing is it. I don't explain it like possessing her, maybe. Yeah, because early in the film, they think that it's the spirit of uh, someone who went two or three generations back, right? Who's, who's possessing her, right? But we learned that that's the uh, elaborate story that they cook up to um, to cover up the murder. Yeah, these are some famous shots. Um, I talked a second ago about the appearance versus reality theme. This is the famous shot of her when she comes out of the bathroom after she becomes blonde again, close to the end. Right? It's almost this sort of like dreamlike sequence. But yeah, we even have a contrast in colors here, right? We have like a purplish tint on one side of the frame and on the other side of the frame we have this like green so um, i don't know what what <laughs> i'm not going to pretend to know why that is right but maybe it has something to do with that like duality theme again i mean whenever she first come out i remember it like it kind of like made her like glow up the green did mm -hmm. it kind of gave me like a supernatural kind of vibe maybe it may seem like she was like the ghost of uh Madeline. It's kind of the vibe that I got from it initially. Yeah, because it kind of looked hazy. I thought, yeah, I thought kind of the same thing. Yeah, the green was giving me supernatural vibes. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, Matt. Uh, it definitely doesn't feel real, right? Maybe supernatural or otherworldly. And we got close-ups of Scotty, right? We make a, uh, Aline made the wonderful life comparison a few minutes ago, but here's when he wakes up from his dream, right? And then we also get a very close-up shot of his eye, right? This is when he's looking at her, right? We got the whole bright red collar, right? We get the eye, sort of a, this is what the eye looks in a sort of like a desirous moment, right? Lust. This is almost like a good scene of like what the eye looks like when it's lusting. So, um, so this scene when he wakes up on the left, that's also when he kind of puts together from that dream that, hey, she's actually, she's actually Madeline. Right? He puts together because of the necklace. So that he kind of wakes up and his dream, the dream that he's living is shattered almost. So those are some famous shots too. Um, I gave some key scenes. We don't have to watch them, but I gave some key scenes. The one where he saves Madeline at the, at the Golden Gate Park. The nightmare scene that I just mentioned. And then... Uh, the scene we also just mentioned where she walks out and is now Madeline again. And the Judy, the Judy identity she has. 
And then I'm, these are the discussion questions I put up on the discussion board. But uh, I've talked enough. That, that's my intro. I just want to see what you guys think now. What do you guys think of this film Vertigo? General impressions. Uh, that was my first time watching. I thought it's pretty good. Uh, I did like that. Uh, my favorite actor was in it. That was from uh, It's a Wonderful Life. He's awesome. <laughs> He's a good actor. I really like his work and almost anything he does. So that's all I know to say because I'm really not feeling very good. Right. I really liked it. It was my first time watching it. But I will say certain old movies or kind of make me kind of sick and there was a few scenes that I just had to stop and just give myself a break. It's the same thing with like movies like the Blair Witch Project, just how the camera works. And that the nightmare scene itself, like I I really thought I was gonna have to stop watching it. I thought it was very funny how uh when he uh having that meeting with that guy when he first was telling him to follow his wife he's sitting there beside it looks like a uh i don't like a model of the titanic and the guy's behind his desk talking and instead of going and sitting at his desk he walks clear across the room to the back of the room and sits down and they're having a conversation clearly like all the way across the room between uh between each other i thought it was kind of funny but that the camera work of it all was just it was a wreck. I agree. I hated it. I ain't gonna lie. I, 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 it took me several hours to get through it. I'm not an Apple to hit shark fan. I don't like Psycho. I don't like the camera work. It's, they had a good plot. I do give it that. It's just, it's too much. He goes too over the top with it. I just, I, I, I'm just not a fan of, I'm just not a fan of it. The busy camera that you guys mentioned. My question is, is that the point, right? Because, um, you know, it's supposed to sort of echo his fear of heights and the panic attacks and all that stuff, right? So I wouldn't say that that's sloppy filmmaking is more of an, maybe that's the point. Um, what do you guys have to say about that? Yeah, I, I liked how I liked how it was shot personally. Uh, this is my first time watching the movie. Uh, I liked everything about it. I, it was very, uh, it was a very uh, crazy movie, to say the least. Uh, I, I would not, I was not expecting where it went at all. That was just pure shocking how it went. I. There's no way I ever would have predicted how the movie went just from the start. Yeah, what well, what was her name? Madeline. Yeah. Uh, she was very unaware of her surroundings because this guy was creeping her. And, and as just sitting there thinking with the time, it ain't no wonder, you know, if people are that unaware of their surroundings, it ain't no wonder why serial kill killers ran free for as long as they did. Yeah, that was something that I was thinking whenever I was first watching. I was like, man, how did how is she not like paying any attention at all to where this guy's following him everywhere? <laughs> how you not catch on to it? I think she knew that what was going on because that the whole plan was to like make him like kind of rescue her and everything. Kind of like make him kind of fall in love and lead him to the tower so he can help fake her death. So I feel like she knew this whole time she was being followed. Yeah, but yeah, after you find out that, then that does kind of change things. And it makes a lot more sense. Even if she did realize, then she'd probably want that to happen anyways. I agree. I think she knew, but him supposedly being a detective, I just felt like he was really sloppy with trilling her. I don't know. That's one of the things I also wasn't a fan of. Like, it was like, it's so obvious that this person's tailgating this, this person. And, you know, if him posted to be a detective, he should know how to tailgate somebody without them knowing. 
Yeah, they were going up all these like back streets and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah I did so like what I messaged you earlier. Whenever she jumped, she made that noise that sounded like a bobcat squalling out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. did like how he uh how he uh used his how he used the the colors like you were talking about how he kind of merged it with the noir style and kind of like made this like this kind of uneasy uh bizarre kind of mixture make it seem like is this really happening is this even real like the transitions from like the dark colors to just all of a sudden bright uh settings he did that a lot with different with different shots with different uh scenes where it'd start off uh, dark and then he'd walk into a different part of the room and it'd just become completely bright. Like the one I talked about in my uh, discussion post, the him going from the dark room, opening it and just all of a sudden there's this flower shop, everything's bright and colorful. And then also later, just in like one of the next few scenes where they go to the Go to the uh, hold on, I'm losing the word here. <laughs> the uh, museum, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that was that's another example. I was thinking of uh, when she was looking at the tombstone, it was my first time watching it too. Um, it it did keep me like it was suspenseful, like it kind of kept my attention. Um, one thing that did kind of bother me, like, I don't know if it made me, I think it kind of made me feel anxious or nervous was like some of the music. Um, it was almost like it would start to like bother me a little bit when it would get like, so I don't know, like, uh, like right at the edge of it, like some of the music would kind of start to bother me, like right before something would happen or, um, uh, like some of the music, but I really thought that, like with the camera, the camera work and everything, especially when he would like look down or when he would like look up at the stairs and how the camera would kind of look, you know, make it almost look like you were a little bit dizzy or a little bit off. I, I kind of looked at that like that was making you feel kind of like what he was looking at so you could relate to the character more is the way that I looked at that part. But um, I thought, I, I don't know, overall I enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I was not a fan of how it ended just because I was like, what? You know, but it did kind of keep me suspenseful up until when everything was going on. And then when we found out that, uh, you know, cause my husband watched, watched it with me. And then when we were, we found out that the husband had that arranged like his friend from college, which I thought it was strange because I think in one part it said he had asked Midge or Midge had asked him, it's like, do you remember this Gavin guy? It's like back from college. But, um, and the way that it kind of, the way that it was worded, it almost made you think that they hadn't spoke really since almost college. So it was kind of strange that he was contacting him out of, you know, like all these years, but it had to be him. And then even after he met with him, it had to be him, you know, that was the one that took care of that. But I think because he knew that, he could trick him because he would not go up the stairs like he would be able to do it and he would not go up the stairs so that you know answered my question like later on why that that was him yeah i thought that uh found that kind of odd too because you're looking at 30 to 40 years later and he says i i want a friend to do it. well if you ain't talked to him in 30 or 40 years how good of a friend is he really and obviously, he couldn't trust him with his wife, so not the best decision. Did you want to say something a minute ago, Matt? I saw you beat your mic. Uh, yeah, it was uh, my brother came in while I was talking, so I had her you mute. Uh, I was thinking of the cemetery. I don't know how that how I, the, that word slipped in my head. Slipped. Uh, out of my mind uh yeah the cemetery cemetery scene was another one where he it starts off with uh scotty walking around in the dark part of the room and then all of a sudden it cuts to madeline standing around in this big bright area it just kind of makes it unsettling
Yeah, and the uh, the music, the way that it was hit, like whenever it showed the tombstone, just reminded me of the uh, old TV, the old Batman TV show, the Adam West Batman back in the day. Yeah, the when it said like bam, whop, right? All those noises in the Batman show, right? Yeah, there yeah, was something about the music as well. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, there was something about the music as well. Like whenever they uh whenever they kiss, uh the shot the music they'd use, uh, I thought was pretty fascinating because it kind of sounded like uh it kind of said like it's like like sounded bad, but also like around the end, it also sounded happy at the same time. It was kind of like weird how the music was done there. It kind of was like sitting like, oh no, this is a bad thing, but it also kind of had like a happy tone to it around the end. That's what I thought was fascinating about the music. Yeah, I'm glad you guys are bringing up all these points about the soundtrack. That's something I didn't think to include in the PowerPoint just now. But now the, the music in the film does play a very significant role. There was something else I didn't like about the movie, too, is I felt like the music was too loud, mm. almost like it was partially, it wasn't so much that it was drowning out the. Uh, actors but it was just too loud it, it was in the it wasn't so much in the background yeah that's that's a good criticism Kenny. Um, sometimes the music takes a backdrop right but yeah, it's, it's very blatant here oh, this Go ahead, this is this is gonna sound <laughs> weird, but when yourself. maybe why he probably made the music so loud is just to help increase the emotions, maybe like just to have, so you feel it. Because I know I brought this up when we talked about Cuckoo's Nest uh, with uh, you know I'm blanking Jack Nicholson's character, like how I thought he had misophonia, just like the over exaggerated noise and stuff, like would trigger him to like angry fits and like panic attacks i thought that could have been used here maybe just to help like trigger those intense emotions yeah i think that's a good point because the like even with um like the whole work with the camera like if he would be up you know somewhere because it would kind of play off of that too because if he was you know like either when he was up on the step or when he was looking out um from a high window or even when he started to go up the tower and he would see like the stairs or look down or anything like that the whole camera would just make you feel like you were doing that too and then the music too because i know the music kind of made me feel like um I don't know, like there would be times like it would be playing and I would just like almost, you know what I mean, have to uh, like, you know, turn it down real quick or, or something because it was like it was just so, um, I guess, like loud or like, you know, so much more intense than I guess like, you know, everything else. So the music was definitely something that um, I wasn't a fan of like the music uh, in the mood in, you know, throughout the film. It, it's different if the music gets loud to like emphasize a certain part of the movie but it wasn't like that it's like it would get loud but it would never come back down it would just stay on that same level through the whole uh, i don't know it was just it's more annoying than anything yeah there's there's a lot of uh, you watch a lot of older movies like that um the music will sometimes get like really loud and then then the movie goes back to like a low volume. So oftentimes when you're watching these old movies, you have to turn the sound up, turn the sound down, it's frequently using the remote. Yeah, I really liked your point, Jane, about maybe that's purposeful. Sort of like how I suggested maybe the camera work was also purposeful in trying to invoke these 
uncomfortable feelings in the audience. What about what about we we talked the whole time about film? Uh, what about the plot? Um, what do you guys think of these characters, especially? I know that um, you know, our main protagonist here. It's hard to argue he's not a little creepy, right? With his obsession with uh, Madeline, it's very uncomfortable. The second half of the movie is very uncomfortable, right? When he's trying to uh, you know, to get the Judy character to become Madeline, so he like tries to buy her the suit. He wants her to redo her hair, all this stuff, right? You know, that definitely made me uncomfortable. Um, how did it, how did yeah, that part I was, I was, I was like, oh my goodness! And then she got up when they were in that store, and she was like, please. And then she's like, please don't make you know. And she's like, that suits enough. And and the lady was like, no, no, I think I know the one you're talking about. And she's going to try to get the other one. And he's like, no, it has to be this one. And she's like, please, I don't want to wear this. And I was just sitting there like, ah. <laughs> yeah, it was like really creepy at first because you thought. You thought he was just going insane trying to make this woman become her, but it turns out the entire time he had a lead on her. He had he had a feeling something was up the entire time. It was a very big twist, and I enjoyed that. And I wondered, too, if maybe, like, once once I got to the end of it and then I was just kind of thinking on it, I wondered if maybe, like, in, in his mind, maybe he knew, like, from the whole time that it was her and maybe he was just trying to um because when he first mentioned to her uh you know about that she was like and because I remind you of her because this will remind you of her so I don't know if he was maybe just trying to push her just enough um to get her to admit you know the way instead of the way that he did when he actually drove her drove her out there I'm just wondering if maybe he was like just trying to continue to push her enough like just to get her to maybe say okay fine I am I it is me I am Madeline instead of doing you know like what all of that he had to do did anybody else notice the uh, <clears throat> the first time they kissed when he went running after her down the uh, down the side of that cliff or whatever. Every time they would kiss, the uh, the waves in the background would hit off that rock and shoot real high. <laughs> so like the, instead of the fireworks in the background, it was the waves from the ocean. It's so cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that uh, those scenes are definitely a little unsettling. Like uh, the taking time bomb that I mentioned earlier, right? You're just wondering to yourself the whole time, like, right? is this guy gonna crack at any second? Did any of you guys think that he was gonna push her off the ledge at the end? Did any of you guys? Did any of you guys think that? Yeah, that's definitely where I thought it was going at first. I was like, oh no, no, he's gonna, he's gonna kill her, and I was like, oh. Oh my God, he knew. I thought at first that where he was sitting there telling her, you know, how he loved her. And then basically he loved her and he thought that he watched her die. I thought he was going to repay her the favor and she was going to stand there and he was going to jump. So because she told him that she loved him, I thought that he was going to jump and commit suicide. Yeah, I thought for a second when they were embracing, I thought he was gonna gonna grab her and then they jump off and he's gonna jump off with her and kill both of them. So I thought that was gonna go for like a split second. There were a few different scenarios that I was trying to play out. Like I was thinking, I thought, well, I thought they're going to get up there and he's going to end up getting dizzy or, um, you know, something's going to happen and he's going to accidentally fall and he's going to be the one that dies or something. And then I thought, because at the very beginning, I think, um, I think it was Midge that said something, uh, 
like another traumatic experience would have to happen or something like that. So then I was thinking, I thought, what if he goes to run up the stairs and, and there, you know, like his vertigo doesn't come back this time. Like, what if it's, what if he can just like run straight to the top or something? And, uh, you know, so then I played, like there was a few different scenarios that I was kind of playing out, but I was just, I don't know. Like, I thought it was so strange. Like, like, what was it like the nun or something that mm -hmm. came like, and I was like, what? And it was just like real quick. And like, and then it was like, bam. And that was it. And I was like, and then I was trying to like, I was like, was that a nun? And I was like, what did she say? And like, what happened? That was almost comical in a way. The nun came up and she was like, here we go again. Better ring the bell. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand what, why did she freak out and jump for I think she. I think she was just trying to run away and then accidentally fell off. I have no clue. It was kind of I weird. Thought, though, yeah. Sorry, Matt. Uh, I thought for a second maybe she thought it was the police coming up since he was a former detective and they they were going to detain her. Maybe so she's like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to jail. I'm too pretty for that. Jumps off, kills herself. I thought, I thought she actually, made it sound like it was Gavin that or like that guy's name. Um, and then he like it was like, okay, you've you know, you've told him the story, you've told him what had happened, and now you know what I mean. So I thought that maybe she thought at first, like she didn't think that it was none, because I just didn't think that that would make any sense if she thought it was the nun and she did it. So I thought, what if she thought that it was Gavin that was coming back and he was like, you know, ups said at her something because she you know ended up telling you know and, and he found out so I, I kind of thought maybe it was him or she thought it was I thought for a minute that after she fell I thought Scotty was going to jump after is what I was thinking was going to happen for a second but obviously it fades out before, any, before we see anything else beyond that which does kind of make me wonder like what, what happens to him afterwards is like do they think that she that he murdered her or Makes me wonder, like, where what happens to him after. But I guess it's kind of the point to leave you thinking by the end of the film. Yeah, it's a pretty abrupt ending. Yeah, Hitchcock doesn't usually end things happily. Um, noir, film noir as a genre in general tends to not end happily. Usually, usually there's lots of death and chaos at the end of them. It's a very pessimistic genre, the war. It, it doesn't look favorably on human behavior and, and things like that. Our next unit, Westerns, completely different. Like Westerns are very, are usually a very positive genre, right, in contrast with noir, which is very pessimistic. What about, um, what about the Midge character? What did you guys think of, some of you guys read about her on the discussion board. Um, what did you guys think her role was? She, she leaves the film about midway through she even has that like exit when she leaves the site board. The way it started out, um, whenever she, I, I think she seen that woman's car, or I don't, I don't know what it was, but she had seen them together. I thought she was going to end up being crazy and snapping and killing him. Madison, you wrote about her on the discussion board. I don't know if you're there or if you want to tell us what you wrote about. She had a good thought about her on the discussion board. On Midge? Yep. Yeah, I thought she was kind of like made to be put in the movie whereas like she's the stark opposite of Madeline so I thought they kind of did that to show maybe the type of woman that he should have been with yeah I think that's a very good point 
Thank you. Yeah, I figured yeah, they would end the up getting well, together. They were engaged for like three weeks in college, I think is what um, they said. And then, but she's the one that um, called it off. And the way that, like, when she kind of saw him and uh, what was it? She called him Scotty O or something yeah. like that. And the way that, um, like, she kind of saw him, I thought that, like, maybe she um, liked him or maybe almost regretted, like, uh, you know what I mean, that she did call it off or which they were in college then. But I mean, like years later, like she kind of looked at him and even went to see him then even after when he was in the, you know, like in the hospital and stuff, like she was trying to care for him and take care of him. And I think that maybe, you know, deep down, like wanted to be with him, maybe. Yeah, you can tell yeah, she, it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you could tell that she definitely did want to get, try to rekindle that, try to bring, try to get back together again uh, after that one scene she kind of has a breakdown after uh after he turns down the date they were going to go on yeah so it was kind of it was kind of like a what if wish wish she had he had ended up with her instead of continuing on with the the whole madeline thing Yeah, that's what I was going to say where he gave she gave him that painting and then he told her that he said that it wasn't funny and I don't know it was just a pretty awkward scene yeah he, he makes the painting look like the painting of uh, Madeline so she's aware of she's kind of creeping on him right the way that the way that he creeps on Madeline I didn't, I didn't catch that. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I think she just wants what she can't have because at the beginning of it, he hints around and stuff like that. And she's like, no, no. And then she sees him with this other woman and then she's painting this thing and having like a mental breakdown because, you know, he didn't like her painting and wanted to go to dinner with her. But at the beginning of the movie, she, you know, much, you know, when he said, you know, was talking to her, I forget what he said exactly, but was talking to her. She pretty much made it clear that, you know, they're friends. And then suddenly she's, you know, wants to be there for him. Well, she wanted to be there for him always. But, I mean, she wanted to be in a relationship with him when she started seeing him get in a relationship with this other woman. I think, too, like, it, because it almost seemed like they would, um, like, they were just kind of like close friends. Just like really just like you know, like one of those friends where you can just say like what you're really thinking, like what you really feel like in front of them. You don't feel like you have to, you know, like holding anything back, like it come up and they were just, you know, just so casually, just like, you know, talking to each other, like really back and forth. And I think when she made that painting, it was almost like um, maybe because she was a little bit jealous because he was with or so infatuated maybe with Madeline. And I think she was maybe trying to do it like as a joke, you know, but maybe she was still a little bit jealous too. And then once she saw his response to it, like he was really, you know, he, I think he said, that's not funny or uh, that's, you know, or something like that. And once she really saw that and then she really realized, well, Hey, like he, you know, then that was mean because then she called herself stupid and the whole thing was stupid. And I think that, uh, I think that that really bothered her then. I don't, I don't know. I think like she really liked him, but she was maybe a little bit jealous because he did like Madeline. She also has this sort of motherly role to him, right? To her, right? Like he, she actually like says in the asylum scene, like mommy's here or something, right? I, I thought I, I was a little confused what was going on there. But um, she she takes on this like nurturer type role to him as well. Um, I don't know if you guys picked up on on that line in the um, asylum. I feel like that scene, which is playing off one of the first scenes with her, where she was like, like no, he was like, stop, you don't have to mother me. So I think she just brought that up at the asylum just to give try to get him to come back a little. Right. There was a different line in the film. Uh, it's kind of unrelated, but uh, I thought it was interesting how you chose to have this film after the prior one because they had they had like the same line 
in uh, both films about how after they saved him, they're like, I can't leave you now. You're my responsibility. I thought it was pretty funny how, how that lined out. Uh, that that was purely a coincidence. Some, sometimes this stuff's by design, right? But that, that was purely a coincidence. <laughs> but yeah, you're, 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 that is interesting, Matt. When we get to the Western unit, uh, first movie we'll watch there, Shane. But we'll watch a movie later in that unit where they're watching Shane in that movie. So, uh, so that'll that'll be a fun one. I did that on purpose. Yeah, the British Film Institute calls this the greatest one of the greatest films of all time. Right? Um, it's I've got to log out. Um, my cousin's here, and I gotta go with her to do something. Let's get ready in anyway. So, okay. All right. But the uh, British Film Institute calls this one of the all time greats. So, um, so, yeah, you guys, you guys all seem to, even if you didn't think the film was for you, uh, I think you guys all came away appreciating it a little bit more. So, which is the whole intent. Yeah, it was pretty great. I don't think I ever would have watched it if it wasn't for this class, so I'm glad I got to see it. So our next one up, Small Holland Drive, a movie made in 2001. It's directed by the great David Lynch. And um, if you thought this movie was, sur was sort of surreal, I'm getting tongue twisted. If you like the surrealism in this movie, the next movie is going to amp that up by 10. So, so get ready. You know, this next movie is definitely sort of a mind mender. Uh, about midway through the movie, you're going to ask, what the heck's happening? So, the, it's a real, Mulholland Drive is an excellent film. Uh, a lot of the same themes we talked about today appearance versus reality and stuff like that, you will see. Mulholland Drive is famous because it has two leading ladies. Right, there's no like leading man in it. We have two leading ladies, so um, yeah, it, it's a very uh, interesting film. You, you guys are definitely gonna have a lot to talk about because you don't even want to know what the heck happened <laughs> after you watch it. So it's definitely not a movie with that comes together to make leave you satisfied with this resolution. It's gonna invite lots of questions. So. Um, That'll be our film for next time. Again, I don't know if it's streaming anywhere. You might have to rent it. But uh, that's our next film. Okay. So. Yeah, I was going to uh, say about that um, vertigo. I'd have, I'd have never, I'd have never sit down and watched it if it wasn't for this class. But I mean, it was. It wasn't bad. It was I after the first ten minutes of it, I never thought I was gonna be able to make it through the whole movie. <laughs> but uh and it turned out being okay. Yeah, Mall Hall and Drive's a much more recent film, so uh so a lot of those like acting techniques from the fifties and stuff, it's it's very modern in this one. So I think a lot of your hang-ups there, Timmy, I don't think you'll have for the next one. I wanted to add to that um, because I know which we have like Amazon, Netflix, like all that stuff, but there's some of these that I've looked ahead on and they're they're not on any of the streaming that we have. Um, we did find uh, Redbox, I think was the name of it. It doesn't cost anything to have that and all you have to do is pay to rent um, you know, just the movie. So that way, if you don't have one of the streaming, um, like already downloaded, you don't have to do like the free trial or download one of those. You can just go to Redbox and then pay just to rent it. And it's about the same price as, as it is on the other ones to rent it anyway. Good to know. 
I usually yeah don't. the the what I always do is I just get on Google and look up watch whatever the name of the movie is online for free and usually I think it's one two three watch or watch one two three usually pulls up a link and it just pulls up you just hit the play button and it I mean the more recent ones uh like you know movies and theaters they're not as easy to find anymore but uh they're these especially these older movies you more than likely are not going to get them for free on youtube so just google them and it'll pull them up and they're pretty pretty easy to find uh put locker sock share stuff like that it's usually got a link yeah, I, I cannot endorse such behaviors but but that's a that's an option right that's a uh, and I can't. I can't. It you just, constant. just, just cut that part of the video out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, but yeah, you can rent these a lot of places. Amazon, Apple TV. That's a good rental service. Um, I tend. I I have an Xbox. I tend to rent stuff on there. I've been renting online on uh, YouTube. YouTube. It's pretty good for renting. So Netflix DVDs are good too. They still exist. So you can sign up for seven bucks a month, uh, get a DVD in the mail, and then send it back whenever you're done. So that's still an option too. So don't forget about that. <laughs> YouTube's good if like you haven't watched the movie yet and you've only got like a few hours left because it gives you the option to <laughs> put it on times two if you need to get to speed. If you need to speed through it a little bit faster. <laughs> You need to put it on one point five speed so you can finish and watching it before class starts. Because there have been a few days I decided to watch it before class the day of, and then they end up cutting it close, so it helped a little bit. We all I didn't have to do it with this film, but don't worry. That was me rewatching Titanic the other day, and I was right up to the last minute ready for class. <laughs> yeah, uh, I may or may not have actually like. Still been watching the movie by the time I joined the class. I was actually watching like the last bit while we were in class. <laughs> it was, uh, I was cutting it close there. All right, guys. Well, I won't hold you any longer. We'll see you all next Tuesday.